Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل صلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد. We begin today's session by praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى who is no doubt our Creator, Sustainer, Nourisher, Protector and Cure. We ask Allah عز وجل to shower His choices of blessings and salutations. Upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, his family members, his companions, and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of death. Alhamdulillah, yesterday we discussed about Prophet Saleh alayhi salatu wa salam. We spoke about his nation who by killing the camel which was a sign and a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they incurred the wrath of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon themselves. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us all from falling into uh, a pit where we incur his wrath and his anger. Ameen. So after that disastrous incident that took place, Salih alayhi salatu wa salam and the believers who were with him, they lived for a period of time upon Tawheed, upon the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after Salih alayhi salatu wasalam, shirk started to rear its ugly head once again. And this time it was in the lands of Babel. It was in the lands of Babel, otherwise known as Babylon. People started to associate partners unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They started to worship idols along with Allah azza wa jal. And they even went on to worship, like I mentioned yesterday, celestial objects like stars, the planets, the moon, the sun, they started to worship celestial objects. So this was the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He appointed a great prophet to remind them. And this prophet was soon to become a Khalil of Allah, a close friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This prophet, he was born in Babel, he was born in Babylon, and his name was Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. Allah Azza wa Jal, He talks about him in Surah Al-Anbiya. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ And indeed, we bestowed upon Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, رُشْدَهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ His portion of guidance aforetime, in the sense before. مِنْ قَبْلُ وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ And we were well acquainted with him. We were well acquainted with him. In regard to his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in regard to his intuition towards Allah azza wa jal, towards Tawheed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on to mention how Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam very politely tried to reason things out with his father. Now before we go further, who was his father? His father's name, according to the uh, Quran, where it called, uh, his name was Azar. His name was Azar and scholars of history mention that he used to make idols for a living. He used to make idols for a living. He used to uh, sculpt idols and sell them. And this is what he used to do for a living. He was a, a carpenter or potter, if you will. He used to make idols and sell them for a living. So Allah Azza wa Jal talks about how Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam very politely tried to reason things out with, with his father. Now we need to understand that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam at that time was a youngster. He was a young boy and he is now trying to reason things out with his father. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it when he states, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صِدِّيقًا نَبِيًّا and mention or remember in the book, in the Quran, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ And mention in the book, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, إِنَّهُ كَانَ صِدِّيقَ النَّبِيَّةِ Verily, he was a man of truth, إِنَّهُ كَانَ صِدِّيقَ He used to speak the truth, and Nabiya, he was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now begins the dialogue, the conversation between Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, young Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, and his father, Azar. إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ يَا أَبَتِ لِمَ تَعْبُدُ مَا لَا يَسْمَعُ وَلَا يُبْصِرُ وَلَا يُغْنِي عَنْكَ شَيْئًا 
My dear father, ya abbots, my dear father, look at the, the polite manner Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam is approaching his father. Ya abbots, lima ta'budu ma la yasma. Why do you worship something that cannot hear? Why are you worshipping something that cannot hear you? Wa la yubusir, nor can it see. La yasma wa la yubusir, wa la yughni anka shay'a. Nor can it benefit you in anything. It cannot avail you in anything. It's just an immovable object, an, an idol, a statue. What's the point of worshipping this? Because it cannot hear, it cannot see, nor can it, can it benefit you in any way. Why are you worshipping this idol? And then he goes on to ask him, Ya Abbot, inni qad ja'ani min al-ilmi ma lam ya'tika. He informs his father, Oh my father, there has come to me of knowledge min al-ilmi ma lam ya'tik. There has come to me of knowledge that you are not aware of. In other words, that has not reached you. He's talking about the prophethood and the revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma lam ya'tik fattabi'ni ahdika siratan sawiyya. So follow me, follow me, I will guide you ahdika siratan sawiyya. I will guide you onto the straight path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us all steadfast upon the straight path. I mean, Ya abati la ta'budi shaytan. Oh my dear father, do not worship the devil. Oh my dear father, do not worship the devil. In other words, don't sell your soul to the devil. Do not worship the devil. Inna shaytana kana lirrahmani asiyya. Verily, the devil, Satan, has been a rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna shaytana kana lirrahmani asiyya. He has been a rebel. He has been disobedient unto the most merciful, Ar-Rahman, the most beneficent. يا أبت إني أخاف أن يمسك عذاب من الرحمن فتكون للشيطان وليا. Oh my dear father, verily I fear a torment may overtake you from Allah, a punishment if you persist in what you are doing. I fear that a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa taala, from the most merciful, from the most beneficent, may overtake you. فتكون للشيطان وليا, and that you may become a companion of the devil. In Jahannam, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. As you can clearly see, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, he was reasoning things out with his father in a very respectable and dignified manner because of the respect that he had towards his father. Because after all, he is his father, his parents, his parents, and it is upon us to treat our parents in a very respectable and dignified manner. Allah Azza wa Jal, whenever he talks about ibadah, and uh, whenever he uh, prohibits us from shirk, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala state? وَاعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Many a place in the Noble Quran, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about ibadah, right after that Allah azza wa jal mentions وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Treat your parents with excellence. Ihsan in the sense with excellence. Excellence upon excellence. Treat your parents with excellence upon excellence. There are many ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, many ayat of the noble Quran that enjoin upon us good treatment towards our parents. Good treatment towards our parents. Otherwise known in the Arabic language as birrul walidain. We need to treat our parents with excellence upon excellence. Even if our parents are disbelievers, yes, we cannot follow them in what is wrong. Nor do we have to listen to them if they command us to do something that is wrong, that is against the guidelines of Sharia. Ah. But other than that, we have no permission whatsoever to sever the ties between ourselves and our parents. We must maintain our family ties with respect and dignity towards them. Because after all, they are our parents. Today, you and I, we are seated here, we are standing here. It is because of what our parents sacrificed. They nurtured us, they grew us up, they made us, they looked after us. They did all of that and here we are now. So we must be grateful unto them and unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by following the commandments of Allah Azza wa Jal in regard to their treatment. We must treat them with excellence upon excellence. We have no permission whatsoever to hurt them. They are massive doorways into Jannah, into paradise. I implore all of you in this month of Ramadan, if you have perhaps, if some things have gone sour with your parents, don't wait for it, don't let it fester, don't let it dwell, dwell rather immediately. Go and patch up things with them, ask for their forgiveness and patch up things with them. There is no point in 
you being a, a great worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshipping Allah azza wa jal throughout the month, if things have gone sour with your parents. Don't let these problems dwell for too long. We must try to patch them up as soon as possible, seek their forgiveness. It doesn't matter whether we are right or wrong. At the end of the day, they are our parents and we need to seek their forgiveness and we need to keep them happy. We need to keep them happy. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he states that if an individual, if an individual makes his mother or father cry, then it is upon that individual to make his mother and father laugh and smile once again. If he wishes to secure the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because very closely linked with ibadah, good treatment towards one's parents. Very close with the pleasure of Allah, the pleasure of one's parents. We need to treat them with the best of treatments. We need to be the best children unto them. This is what Islam teaches us. And remember my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, what goes around comes around. In other words, if you do something, you will have to face the consequences in regard to your deeds, either in this world or the hereafter. If you do good, you will receive good. If you do bad, no doubt you will receive bad, either in this world or the hereafter. So we must do good to receive good. Once, there was a scholar from the lands of Arabia, he mentioned a story that took place. And the story as well took place somewhere in the lands of Arabia. This is in regard to an individual who had two parents and his mother passes away and now he has only his father. His father was a very old man and he was finding it difficult to manage things by himself because he was old due to senility, due to old age, he was finding it very difficult. So, but he didn't want to burden his son because his son was now married and his son had a little child of his own as well, a young boy. So the father did not want to burden his son by perhaps moving into their house and uh, you know, he thought that it would inconvenience them. But after some time, what happened was the son found it a burden upon himself because he had to travel often from his house to his father's house to visit him and then he started falling sick and things like that. He was finding it very difficult to look after him being you know, in his own house. So he approached his father and said that, you know, why don't you move into my house? It will be a lot easier for me to look after you then. So the father then uh, looks at his son and says, but son, I don't want to burden you. I don't want to inconvenience you. Then the boy said, uh, no, but you being here is a bigger burden for me. So if you move into my house, it will be a lot easier for me to look after you. So the father agrees, he packs his things and now he moves into his son's house. But the son did not inform his wife in regard to this new development. And the wife, in other words, the old man's daughter-in-law was not happy at all with this new arrangement. She goes to the son, in other words, and she tells him, uh, you know, why on earth have you brought your father in here? Am I to be a slave to my father-in-law now? Am I to look after your father? I got married to be with you and look after you, not look after your father. You know, she started to speak in a very harsh way. The boy then said, no, please, you know, he, he's old and we need to look after him. These may be his uh, last days and I have to be with him, I have to look after him. He convinced his wife. Now days pass and what happens is generally when they serve food because of old age, you know, he started breaking the crockery, the, the utensils, he started dropping things, he started spilling food and, it, you know, he was making things a little difficult because of his old age. And the wife of this man, the young man, she was also not making things easy. She was making it difficult by, you know, keeping on nagging by her husband and complaining to him that, look, it's a big uh, difficulty for me. I can't maintain the house. It's very difficult with your father. Please take him out of the house. Why don't we keep him out? We have the quarters outside. Now, these quarters were generally used for drivers and, and the servants of the house. The, uh, this lady, she told the man, look, why don't you keep him outside and he won't make a mess in the house and we can still look after him. Allahu Akbar. The man, he listened to his wife. And that is what is happening sadly today. Children, youngsters are listening to their friends, disobeying their parents. Men are listening to their wives and disregarding their mothers, disregarding their fathers. Allahu Akbar. My dear brother, 
any woman on earth can be your wife, but any woman cannot be your mother. Just any woman cannot be your mother. Your mother is your mother. But any woman on earth can be your wife. And dear sister, any man on earth can be your husband, but your father is your father. No one can replace your father. So we must give priority to them. We must look after them. But this man, he listened to his wife, and now he goes to his father and tells his father, Dad, I'm really sorry, but you know, you seem to be making a big mess at home, and it's difficult to look after you, and my wife is also finding it difficult, so I kindly request you to please move out of the house, and you can live in the quarters outside, but we will still look after you. I hope you don't mind. The father's heart was broken. I mean, he brought this boy up. He looked after him. He gave him the very best. He strove hard. He perhaps paid for his education, and now today he's an engineer, he's a doctor, he's what not, all because of his father's struggle. And now the boy is telling the father, now he's, you know, in his old age, ripe old age, and the boy is telling his father, get out, you can stay in the quarters outside. The man, he does not say a word, he packs his bag, and he quietly moves out because like I said earlier, he did not want to be an inconvenience and he did not want to be a burden upon his son. He moves out to the driver's quarters and now he lives there. Now what used to happen was this girl, the lady, she used to cook food for the family and because she valued her expensive crockery, her ceramic ware, she did not want to send the plates out to the driver's quarters because she feared that the old man, her father-in-law, might break the expensive plates. So she got a cheap plastic plate and she used to uh, put the food on that plate and send it uh, through the maids. And this plate, because it was made of plastic, after a period of time, it started to get moldy and old. It started to get very uh, dirty and old looking, but she did not bother to change the plate. She kept sending the food using the same plate. Now, after a few days had passed, one day, the uh, maid takes the food, the plate, and she goes to give the food. She knocks on the door because in general she used to knock the door and leave the food by the door because the old man would open the door and then take the food. They wouldn't even go inside to see his plight. Now since the day his father moved out, the young man never ever visited his father because he was busy. He did not bother to visit his father. Now after a period of days, now what happens is this maid goes to give the food. The maid knocks on the door and there's no response. So she knocks again, no response. So finally she was wondering what's happening and she opens the door. The sight that greeted her shocked her. She dropped the plate onto the floor because the old man was sprawled on the ground. He had passed away. He had passed away. She runs back home saying, the grandfather has passed away. The grandfather, because she also used to call him grandfather because of his old age. The grandfather has passed away. The grandfather has passed away. Now the man was getting ready to leave for work. The minute he heard that, you know, shock gripped him because it was his father at the end of the day. He runs outside and he asks the maid, what happened? What happened? No, your father has passed away. He sprawled on the ground. The man rushes to the quarters to see what had, what had happened. And then when he saw his father and when he saw the state that his father was in, he was appalled and disturbed because his father was sprawled on the ground. There were dirty clothes strewn all over the room and the room had a bad stench to it. And then the plate was thrown on the ground because the maid had dropped the plate. There was food all over the place. And there was this bad, disgusting smell that was coming from the room because nobody bothered to clean the room nor help the old man wash himself, etc. So the room was in a very bad state. The man just entered and came out and then he quickly called the maid and he said, get the drivers, get the maids, we need to clean the place up, get some garbage bags and call the funeral service so that they can arrange for, uh, you know, the burial arrangements for my father and get some garbage bags, let's clean this up, the house looks a mess. Now whilst he was instructing the maids and the drivers to do what they had to do, his little boy, his son comes running because he too had heard that grandfather had passed away. He comes, he didn't have a good relationship with his grandfather because he rarely saw his grandfather, the little boy. He comes running into the room and he sees the little, the plastic plate thrown on the ground. He goes and takes the plate. The man 
the minute he saw his son taking the plate, he said, son, what are you doing? Why are you taking that dirty plate? I don't know how much of germs and bacteria might be on it. Just leave it. Come outside. This is not where you need to be. Go back home. Go back to your mother. The boy, the little boy, very adamantly hugs the plate and he says, no, 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 dad, I need this plate. The father, the man, he asks him, why do you need this plate? It's so dirty. Just go back home. The little boy says, no, dad, I need this plate because when you become old, I have to feed you on the same plate. You see? Like I said, what goes around comes around. If you do good, you will receive good, inshallah ta'ala. But if you do bad, you have to no doubt face the consequences, the repercussions. You have to face it either in this world or the hereafter. Allah Azza wa Jal is the best of judges. Not even an atom's weight or a mustard seed uh, amount would be, you know, uh, left, let to go in, uh, in rain or the oppression will not be, uh, a blind eye will not be turned in regard to even an atom's weight of oppression or a mustard seed's amount of oppression. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So coming back to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, as you can see, he was having a very respectable, dignified conversation with his father. And he spoke to his father. He was trying to reason things out with his father in a very respectable manner. But, sad, but sadly, his father responds back in a very harsh manner. In a very harsh manner. Ibrahim والسلام, was trying to make his father understand things and see the light of Tawheed. But sadly, the father now responds back in a very harsh manner and he says, The father says, Do you reject my gods, O Ibrahim? لَإِن لَمْ تَنْتَهِ لَأَرْجُمَنَّكَ وَهْجُرْنِي مَلِيًّا And then he goes on to say, if you do not stop this, in other words, this dialogue, I will stone you, I will definitely stone you to death. لَأَرْجُمَنَّكَ I will definitely stone you to death. وَهْجُرْنِي مَلِيًّا So, go away from here before I punish you. Just get away from here. He chases his son. His, he chases his son away and not just away from where they were talking he chases him away from his house he says get away from here you and I we have nothing to do get away from here he threatens Ibrahim والسلام, and he chases him away from his house but even after such a harsh response Ibrahim والسلام, responds back to his father maintaining the same respect and dignity as earlier he states قَالَ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكَ He says, Peace be unto you, my dear father. سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكَ سَأَسْتَغْفِرُ لَكَ رَبِّي إِنَّهُ كَانَ بِحَفِيَّةٌ Don't worry, I will pray for you. I will ask forgiveness of my Lord for you. إِنَّهُ كَانَ بِحَفِيَّةٌ Verily, He is the most merciful unto me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful unto me. Now in regard to seeking forgiveness for his father, this was not something that he had been prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time. And that is why Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam said so. But later on, Allah azza wa jal reveals that it is not permissible for uh, for it's not permissible for the Prophet or the believers to seek forgiveness for the kuffar, for the ones who have associated partners unto Allah or rejected Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he was a young boy at that time, like I said earlier, but Allah Azza wa Jal had blessed him with knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with wisdom and Allah azza wa jal had blessed him with a correct intuition towards Tawheed. And this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Noble Quran. So thus did we show Ibrahim the kingdom of the heavens and the earth so that he becomes one of those who have firm conviction. So that he brings about faith with certainty. So this was something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, like I said, because he was an 
intelligent young boy, he looked up at the heavens and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلُ رَأَى كَوْكَبًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّهِ فَلَمَّا أَفَلَ قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ When the night enveloped him, when the night covered him with darkness, he saw, he saw a star, Ra'a Kaukaba. He saw a star. And then Qala, Hada Rabbi, this is my Lord. The young boy, he was looking up at the heavens and he saw a star and he said, Hada Rabbi, this is my Lord. Falamma afal. But when the star vanished, when the star you know, disappeared, I mean when the dawn starts to break, the stars all disappear, he goes on to say, Qala la uhibbul afilin. Indeed, I do not like those things that disappear. I don't like those things that set. Because what he was trying to highlight here is that a God has to be present at all times. I mean, he cannot be present at a time and absent at another time. Allah Azza wa Jal is never absent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present. So when he saw that the star had vanished, he said, I don't like things that vanish. When he saw the moon now rising, he said, okay, this is my Lord. But then the moon vanished as well. The moon vanished after a period of time. And then he said, Ya Allah, he says, Rabbi, unless my Lord guides me, I will surely be amongst those who commit mistakes or those who have gone astray. And he was praying that Allah should guide him. Next, he sees the sun. Now when he saw the sun, he said, this is my Lord because this is greater. The sun is obviously greater than the moon and greater than the stars. But then what happens? The sun set as well. And then he says, That's when he realizes all of these celestial objects are nothing but things that people have associated unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the supreme Lord. So he says, Oh my people, I am indeed free from all those things that you associate as partners unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally he declares his faith. Verily, I have turned my face towards him who has created the heavens and the earth, Hanifan. In other words, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Worshipping none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And I am not from the mushrikun. I am not from those who associate partners unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now after this declaration, he now goes to his people. Now this was after his, after his conversation with his father. He now goes to his people and tries to reason things out with them. إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ مَا هَذِهِ التَّمَاثِيلُ الَّتِي أَنْتُمْ لَهَا عَهَكِفُونَ He said to his father and his people, What are these tamathil? What are these effigies? What are these statues? أَنْتُمْ الَّتِي أَنْتُمْ لَهَا عَكِفُونَ To which you are devoted so much. I mean, what are these statues that you are so devoted unto? They're not going to benefit you in any way. And their reply was, they said, we found our fathers. We found our fathers worshipping these idols. That is why we are now worshipping them. Ibrahim والسلام, being so young at that time, he admonishes them. He admonishes them. قَالَ لَقَدْ كُنْتُمْ أَنْتُمْ وَآبَاؤُكُمْ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُّبِينٍ He said, indeed, you and your fathers, 
your predecessors have been in manifest error. You have been in a clear error. You have committed a big mistake, a grave mistake. Now they question Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Qalu ajitana bil haqqi am anta min al-la'ibin. They ask him, have you brought us the truth? Ajitana bil haqq am anta min al-la'ibin. Are you just playing around? Are you just fooling around with us? قَالَ بَلْ رَبُّكُمْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الَّذِي فَطَرَهُنْ وَأَنَا عَلَى ذَلِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاهِدِينَ Now he says, Nay, your Lord, your Lord, رَبُّكُمْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Your Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth who created all of that. And I am one of the witnesses, I witness to that. Allahu Akbar. And they don't seem to be responding. They don't seem to be listening to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he just, you know, voices this out to himself. But some of the people heard it. He said, وَتَاللَّهِ لَأَكِيدَنَّ أَصْنَامَكُمْ بَعْدَ أَن تُوَلُّوا مُدْبِرِينَ He says, I will plot a plan to destroy your idols after you have gone away and turned your backs. Now this was something, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, that was revealed unto Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. He was a prophet, remember. So he was inspired to do this and he wished to drive a strong point home. And this is why he plotted this plan. So after a period of time, now Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam has grown up, okay? And a day of celebrations came about. A day of celebrations came about. They had a day of Eid, where in general, they used to go and offer a lot of sacrifices to their idols and their statues. And then they used to go out to the outskirts of the village or the city. And then they used to celebrate the whole night. They used to celebrate doing all kinds of wild and lewd acts throughout the night. This was their day of celebration. So when this day approached, they started to invite people and gather a crowd. So they invited Ibrahim والسلام, as well. To which he seized the opportunity and he replied, فَقَالَ إِنِّي سَقِيم. He said, I'm sorry, I'm not feeling that well, I'm sick. Now you might wonder, did Ibrahim والسلام, lie? Did he lie? Well, scholars, rahimahumullah, they explain that he intended when he said, فَقَالَ إِنِّي سَقِيم. He said, I am sick and he was intending that he was sick at heart. He was sick and appalled by that what was happening around him. He was sick of everything that was taking place around him. So this is what he meant when he said, فَقَالَ إِنِّي سَقِيمٌ Even though he deems it as a lie. Later on, uh, you will uh, study inshaAllah Ta'ala. He deemed it as a lie. He deemed it as a lie. He deemed this as a lie. He deemed uh, another lie as well. When they were crossing the border of Egypt, there was a, uh, uh, an oppressor of a king who tried to uh, take them as prisoners. So at that point too, he referred to his wife as his sister. But there is an interpretation, interpretation to that as well because he could have meant his sister in Islam. So we have interpretations. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he deemed these statements as lies, but still, the scholars rahimahumullah have put forward interpretations because a prophet of Allah, he knew what he was doing at the end of the day. So he said, فَقَالَ إِنِّي سَقِيم I'm sick, just leave me alone. So the people left him alone and they went about with their celebrations. So they started off by offering a lot of sacrifices unto their idols, unto their statues. And like I said, they headed out to the outskirts of the village now to celebrate. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he seizes the opportunity and now he goes to the idols. So there was a place, perhaps a, a temple or a place of worship where they had kept all of their idols. He goes to the idols. فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ آلِهَتِكُمْ فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ آلِهَتِهِمْ فَقَالَ أَلَا تَأْكُلُونَ He goes to their gods, their idols, and he says, you know, there are so much of offering, so much of food around you. Why? He's talking to the idols now. Why are you not eating these, uh, you know, offerings that the people have offered unto you? Why are you not consuming the food? Why are you not eating of the food? Malakum la tantiqun. What is the matter? Why are you not speaking with me? Why don't we have a nice conversation? Why are you not talking? Faragha alayhim darban bil yameen. He knew he was just, you know, trying to drive a point here that these idols have no strength whatsoever to eat, drink, to talk, to see, to speak, to hear. 
they could not benefit nor harm anything. They could not even protect themselves. Allahu Akbar. Now he had an axe with him, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. He had something similar to an axe. He started to break idol after idol. He started to break idol after idol into smithereens. He broke each and every idol. Faragha alayhim darban bil yameen. He turned upon the idols, striking the idols with his right hand. Faja'alahum judadha. He broke them to smithereens. He broke them to pieces, tiny, tiny pieces. Illa kabiran lahum. Except the biggest of them all. There was a huge idol, the main, the, the boss idol. He left that alone and he broke all the other idols. And finally, he took the axe and slung it over the neck of that idol and he leaves. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam leaves. He, like I said earlier, was inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was, he was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what he did. And he wanted to drive a very powerful message home. Now the people come back after their celebrations. They come back after their celebrations. And they go by the temples. They go by their temples and they see a sight that shocks them and leaves them aghast and petrified. They saw all their idols in pieces. And then they asked, They cry out, Who has done this to our gods? Who has done this to our aliha? The one who did it must indeed be from the zalimun, the oppressors, the wrongdoers. Allahu Akbar. Their idols cannot protect themselves, let alone protect the people. And now they're looking at their idols and they are so petrified. Who has done this to our idols? The one who did it must be from the oppressors. Now there was a group of people, like I said, who remembered that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam had said something along the lines of these words, Tallahi la akidanna aslamakum ba'da antuallu mudhibirin. I will plot against your idols. So this group, qalu sami'na, they said, we heard fatan, a youngster, yadkuruhum yuqalu lahu Ibrahim. We heard a young man talking against our idols, and this young man, he is known as Ibrahim. His name is Ibrahim. Now the, the, the majority, they say, They said, then bring him. Bring this youngster before the eyes of the people so that they may testify. Now this group, they said, bring him in front of the people so that the group that said that they heard him saying that he will plot against the idol so that they may testify against him, bring him. Now they go and they bring Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. My dear brothers in Islam, put yourselves in the shoes of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Just imagine. Now being brought to be interrogated. Just imagine. But still he was courageous, he was strong, he was bold. And he did not waver, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. They brought him and now they start to interrogate Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. They ask him, قَالُوا أَأَنْتَ فَعَلْتَ هَذَا بِآلِهَتِنَا يَا Ibrahim. They ask him, Ibrahim, are you the one who did this to our gods? Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam very, very coolly replies, قَالَ بَلْ فَعَلَهُ كَبِيرُهُمْ هَذَا He replies, no. That guy, he's the one who did it, the big guy. He's got the axe around his neck. Why don't you ask him? فَاسْأَلُوهُمْ إِنْ كَانُوا يَنْتِقُونَ Why don't you ask him if he can speak? Now they angrily reply, ثُمَّ نُكِسُوا عَلَىٰ رُوُوسِهِمْ لَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ مَا هَأُولَاءِ يَنْتِقُونَ They say, Ibrahim, you know very well that these idols cannot speak. Why are you talking foolishly? These idols cannot speak. Now this was the moment Ibrahim alayhi salatu was was waiting to drive this point very strongly home. He says, then what on earth is the point of you worshipping these things other than Allah that do not benefit you nor harm you? Why are you worshipping these things? You know that they cannot speak. You know that they cannot protect themselves. You know that they cannot benefit you nor harm you. So why on earth are you worshipping these things other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then he goes on to say, Fie upon you, woe be unto you. And upon that which you worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have you no knowledge? 
Can you not understand? Why can't you perceive things? He says this very harshly unto them. Now the people, they were at a loss. And they decided, they were at a loss. They were at a loss for words. They, didn't know what, they did not know what to say. Because they were cornered. They were properly cornered. So they decided to teach Ibrahim a lesson. They decided to teach Ibrahim a lesson. And they decided to burn Ibrahim alive to avenge their false gods who were broken into pieces. So they, some of them said, So they said, burn him, burn him, thereby helping your gods. In other words, burn him to avenge your gods. As a move to avenge your gods, burn him alive. If you're going to do something, burn him alive. So now the people, they start to build a huge fire, a huge bonfire, a huge furnace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions what they said at that time. They said, build for him bunyana, build for him a building of fire. In other words, a furnace so big that it is like a building. A fire that is so huge, they should look like a building. فَأَلْقُوهُ فِي الْجَحِيمِ And then throw him into the blazing inferno. Throw him into the blazing fire. Allahu Akbar. فَأَرَادُوا بِهِ كَيْدًا فَجَعَلْنَاهُمُ الْأَسْفَلِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, they plotted against Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, but we made them losers. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So these people, they started to gather firewood from all over the place. They started to gather firewood from all over the village. They started to gather as much firewood as possible. And there were even people, there were even women who used to take oaths. They used to go to the temple and they used to take oaths by their gods, by their idols, that if this happens, if that happens, if, uh, if, if, if I, for example, if I am blessed with a child, if I am blessed with a child, if I am you know, blessed with so much of wealth, I will gather this many piles of firewood, that many piles of firewood. If I am blessed with children, if I am blessed with this and that. They used to take oaths. They say, if I am blessed with a child, I will gather 10 piles of firewood to burn Ibrahim. And then just in case, if it was a decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if that individual gave birth to a child, she used to go and collect 10 piles of firewood and come and dump it to burn Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, a huge fire was built, so huge that even birds could not fly over the fire. Even birds could not fly over the fire, except that these birds would fall to the ground charred due to the intense heat of the huge flames that leaped around. It was such a huge bonfire that they built. His father, his mother, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam's father, mother, they were all, his whole family, they were all part of the audience waiting to see Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam burnt alive. But now, they were in a predicament, they were in a bit of a problem. They had built such a huge fire that they had no way of getting close to the fire. They had no way of getting close to throw Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam into the fire. The scholars of history mention that the devil, shaitan, he came to them in the guise of a human being and taught them how to build a catapult. He taught them how to build a catapult. And historians mention that this was the first catapult ever to be built. This was the first catapult ever to be built. So they built this catapult to fling him into the fire. They tie Ibrahim والسلام, onto the catapult and they were about to fling him into the fire. Now let's pause for a moment. Just imagine how Ibrahim والسلام, must have felt at that moment. Put yourselves, there's no point in just talking about the story if we do not uh, internalize the story and try to derive lessons. Just imagine how he must have felt. This was the point when Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam comes down. Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, like we mentioned in the previous session, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, not just any ordinary angel, archangel Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, the biggest and most powerful of all angels, he comes down and he says, Ya Khalil Allah, O friend of Allah, just tell me what you want done. Just tell me what you want done. The size of Jibreel, if you were to just, I think, 
flick his wing like this, the fire would have, you know, extinguished. If he had just flicked his wing a little. Ibrahim والسلام, looks at Jibreel والسلام, and very calmly he says, From you, I need nothing. My focus is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hasbunallah, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil, ni'mal mawlaha wa ni'mal nasir. Allah is sufficient for us. Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. And He is the best disposer of your affairs. You may be going through a bit of difficulty, a patch of trouble in life, but never lose hope, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Never despair, never lose faith in your maker who is the best disposer of your affairs. He is the best disposer of your affairs. He will look after you, he will, he will dispose of your affairs in the best manner possible. Just have faith and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, he says, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil, ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal nasir. That's when he said that, they released, they launched the catapult, and he was thrown right into the blazing fire. The people were looking on with glee and happiness, expecting him to burn to ashes. Because such a huge fire, birds could not fly over the fire, except that they fell to the ground charred and burnt black. He was thrown right into the midst of the flames, so they were expecting him to burn to ashes. But something entirely different took place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the blazing fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the fire, O fire, be a coolness and safety for Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, what are the general properties of fire? To burn, to burn things to ashes. These are the properties of fire. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the properties of fire to become a place of coolness and safety. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, scholars mention that if Allah azza wa had only said, Qulna ya narukuni barda, O oh fire, be a place of coolness for Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam would have frozen inside there. It would have become colder than even the North Pole or the South Pole. It would have become a place so cold. But Allah Azza wa Jal said, Bardan wa salaman. Become a place of coolness and safety for Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, later on when he came out, he states that the time that he spent inside the fire was the best period of time that he had ever spent on the face of this earth. Because Allah Azza wa Jal had commanded the fire to be a place of safety, a place of coolness, happiness for Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, قُلْنَا يَا نَارُكُونِ بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ Ibrahim. Now, Allah commands the fire to be a place of coolness and safety only for Ibrahim. Ala Ibrahim, just for Ibrahim. What about the ropes that were around Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam? He had been tied. Even those ropes, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, burned to ashes. The, the ropes burned to ashes, but not a single hair of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was harmed. Not a single hair. Because he had the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal states, Wa aradu bihi kayda fajalnahum al-akhsarin. They planned, they plotted to harm him, but we made them losers. Allahu Akbar. Now the people around the fire, they could all see Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam safe and sound within the blazing flames. They could see him safe and sound. They can see him praying unto Allah, they can see him offering gratitude, maybe sajda to shukr, prostrations of gratitude unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they were amazed, they were shocked. They were thinking, how on earth is this possible? But sadly, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, even after witnessing such a big miracle, as is the case with mankind, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam comes out of the fire, you know, perfectly safe and sound and the only people to believe in Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam were his wife Sarah and his nephew Lut alayhi salatu wasalam whose story is coming up inshallah ta'ala. The Prophet Lut alayhi salatu wasalam and his wife Sarah. These were the only two believers 
who believe in Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now this news of this amazing spectacle travels to the king of that village, of that city at that time. His name was Namrud. The minute he heard about this, the minute he got to know about it, he commands Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam to come to his palace because he wanted to prove his power to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions this conversation in the Noble Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِي حَاجَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ فِي رَبِّهِ أَنْ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكِ إِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّيَ الَّذِي يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتُ قَالَ أَنَا أُحْيِي وَأُمِيتُ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقَ فَأْتِ بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي كفر والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين. And did you not see the one who disputed with Ibrahim عليه الصلاة والسلام in regard to Allah سبحانه وتعالى في ربه أن آتاه الله الملك and this was because Allah سبحانه وتعالى had given him a kingdom. He thought of himself. He thought high and mighty of himself just because Allah عز وجل had blessed him with a kingdom. إذ قال إبراهيم ربي الذي يحيي ويميت. إبراهيم عليه الصلاة والسلام said my Lord is the one who gives life and death. قال أنا أحيي وأميت. This king Namrud. He said, I too give life and death. He called for two prisoners who were in prison. He released one prisoner and he executed the other prisoner saying, look, I gave life to that prisoner. I killed this one. I also give life and death. Ibrahim والسلام, then uses a beautiful logic to corner him. And he says, قال إبراهيم فإن الله يأتي بالشمس من المشرق. My Allah, he brings out the sun. He makes the sun rise from the east. فأتي بها من المغرب, if you can. Bring the sun, make it rise from the west if it is possible. فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي كَفَرَ The ones who disbelieve, they were utterly defeated. بُهِت in the sense they were flabbergasted. They couldn't say anything. What can they say? Can he bring the sun from the west? Can he bring it out from the west? Totally impossible. So they were utterly defeated. They were cornered. وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah guides not the people who are ظَالِمُونَ who are wrongdoers, who are oppressors. After this incident, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah Azza wa Jal, He commands Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam to leave his people and to leave the land that he was in. In other words, he was commanded to migrate away from that land. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he leaves that land, he leaves his people with his wife Sarah and his nephew Lut. So where did he migrate? Where did he go? What happened afterwards? All of that insha'Allah ta'ala, we will be discussing it in tomorrow's session. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala ashrafi anbiya'i wal mursaleen. نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد. We begin as always by praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى who is our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and curer. We ask Allah عز وجل to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyam. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, yesterday we discussed the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam in Iraq, like we mentioned, in Babel, the lands of Babylon. And towards the end of yesterday's uh, discussion, we spoke about the argument that took place. We spoke about Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and the idols, about the qawm, his nation, uh, plotting to uh, burn him alive and the fact that they prepared a huge bonfire, a huge fire. We mentioned yesterday that even birds could not fly on top of the fire except, except that they would fall to the ground, charred black, burnt black. So the people, they launched uh, a catapult and fired Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam right into the midst of the blazing uh, flames. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commanded the flames the, the burning fire to be a place of coolness and safety. And then Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he remained safe and sound 
and he came out as well, safe and sound. We mentioned all of this. And towards the end of yesterday's discussion, we spoke about the argument that took place between the king of those lands, his name was Namrud, and Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. He put forward an argument. He said that I can give life and death just as your God, just as Allah can give life and death. He called for two prisoners. He released one prisoner and that was his version of giving life. And he had the other prisoner executed. And he said, look, I gave life to that individual and I gave death to this individual by executing him. And then Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he cornered him with some amazing logic and reasoning. He told him, my Lord Allah, he makes the sun rise from the east. If you are so powerful, make it rise from the west, opposing the north. To which he, at the end of the day, was utterly defeated. He had no reply, reply whatsoever to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. The animosity of the people started to grow, uh, grow as well as uh, in regard to the king. He too started to plot and plan against Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And Allah Azza wa Jal commanded Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam to leave the lands of Iraq. To leave the lands of Iraq. And like we said yesterday, the only two individuals who believed in Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam were his wife Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam and his nephew Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. These were the only two individuals who believed in Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So the command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and he leaves Iraq and now he's headed towards Palestine, Palestine. He was headed towards Palestine. So he was making hijrah, he was migrating from Iraq, from the lands of Iraq towards uh, to uh, Palestine uh, as in accordance with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal talks about this where he states, فَآمَنَ لَهُ لُوتُ وَقَالَ إِنِّي مُهَاجِرٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ So Lut alayhi salatu wasalam, he believed in him. فَآمَنَ لَهُ لُوتُ Lut alayhi salatu wasalam believed in Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. وَقَالَ Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam now says, إِنِّي مُهَاجِرٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي I will migrate for the sake of my Lord. إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Verily, he is the Almighty, the All-Wise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also goes on to say وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ وَلُوطًا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَتْنَا فِيهَا لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we, وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ We rescued him, we saved Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam وَلُوطًا And Lut alayhi salatu wasalam إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَتْنَا فِيهَا لِلْعَالَمِينَ To the land, we saved them both and we instructed them to go to the land which we have blessed for the alameen, in the sense for mankind and jinn kind. We have blessed the land of Palestine. And they're headed towards Palestine. On the way to Palestine, some historians mention that this incident took place on the way to Palestine. They had to cross Egypt and this incident took place then. And others state that it was after they had gone and settled down in Palestine. Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and his wife Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, they were traveling and they crossed Egypt and this incident takes place. Now, Egypt at that time was ruled by a tyrant, an oppressor, uh, another Fir'aun perhaps. So Egypt at that time was ruled by this oppressor who had a very unusual fetish. He had commanded his soldiers, his forces, that if anybody, if any caravan were to pass by Egypt or had to cross the lands of Egypt, the caravan had to be checked. In other words, the travelers had to be checked. And if there were women, and as long as these women were the wives of those men who were within that caravan or the travelers, then he had instructed the soldiers to bring the women to him. He had this fetish where he used to abuse other people's wives. He used to uh, abuse the wives of other men. This was where he, uh, you know, took, uh, th this was something that he took uh, a lot of pleasure in. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he was informed about this king and they had to travel through Egypt, there was no other option. And whilst they were crossing Egypt, the soldiers, the forces, they stopped them and they started to check them. And at that point, they asked Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, who is this lady? I mean, what is her relationship with you? Now, the instructions of the king were very specific. They were only to be brought if they were that individual's wives. I mean, if they were related in any other way, he was not interested. I mean, if they, if they were uh, 
mothers or sisters, then he wasn't interested. But if, it, if a lady was someone's wife, only then he would be uh, interested in that particular lady. So Ibrahim والسلام, knowing about this tyrant of a king, he replied, she is my sister and he was intending that she was his sister in Islam and not a blood sister because after all she was his wife. So he intended that she is my sister in Islam and he replied to the forces. But now the thing was that Sarah والسلام, was a very very beautiful lady. She was very beautiful. So the minute the soldiers saw her, they felt that you know our king has to see this woman. So they said it doesn't matter even if she be your sister, we have to take her to the king. If the king releases her, it's a different story, but we have to take her to the king. And by force, they kidnap her and they take her to the king. Ibrahim والسلام, was in anguish, was in so much of grief. Just imagine your wife plucked away from you and now is being taken captive. Is taken captive to a king who is known to be a tyrant. Allahu Akbar. Ibrahim والسلام, he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He raises his hands in dua. Now this is the quality of a true believer, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Whenever you are in a difficulty, whenever you are in a predicament, it is upon you to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is upon you to turn to Allah azza wa jal. Because we learn so many lessons from the life of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, and the greatest lesson of them all is tawakkul. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal nasir. We learned this very well even yesterday, when he was about to be thrown into the blazing flames. Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam comes down and he offers help. Allahu Akbar. Archangel Jibreel. He says, what do you want done, ya Khalil Allah? What do you want done, O friend of Allah? To which Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam very calmly replies, from you I need nothing. I wait for the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah azza wa jal directly commanded the fire to be a place of coolness and safety for Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So even in this particular situation, his wife is being plucked away from him, taken captive, and is being taken to the king who is known to be a tyrant. He, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and prays unto Allah azza wa jal. Now, Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, she's taken to the king. And no sooner she was presented in front of the king, and he was a pervert. He was a corrupt individual, this particular king. The minute he saw the exquisite beauty of Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, he could not contain himself, he could not control himself, he outstretched his hand to touch her in a bad manner. The minute he tried to do that, she, Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, she too after all being the wife of the friend of Allah, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, she turns to Allah azza wa jal, she immediately raises her hands in dua. No sooner she raised her hands in dua, the king's hand, you know, became paralyzed and fell to his side. The king's hand became paralyzed, he lost, you know, control of his arm and it fell to his side. But he was surprised, what's happening? He was in so much of fear. He cries out, Oh, please help me. Pray unto your God and release me from this torture that I am going through. Because he was in excruciating pain as well. So he said, please release me from the torture that I am going through. I will not harm you, just release me. She then prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this king's hand goes back to normal. But no sooner that happened, he once again outstretches his hand to try and touch her. She again prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this time the pain was intense, even more intense. It doubled. He was in much more pain. And then he cries out again, please, look, I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to harm you. Just release me from this. Pray to your God and release me from this. She prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this man was released. But did he learn his lesson? No. He tries to outstretch his hand again. This is... He was such a you know, corrupt individual and such a pervert individual. He outstretches his hand again to touch her. And this time she prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the pain was just unbearable. He couldn't bear it at all. He cries out, I promise you, I will not harm you. If you release me, if you pray to your God and release me, I will gift you something and send you on your way. I will gift you something and send you on your way. Just release me from this uh, grip of yours. So she prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the king's hand goes back to normal. The king cries out, he calls out his soldiers, his forces, and he tells them, you have brought a witch, you have brought a witch who has supernatural powers, 
get her away from here and he calls for the baby he had promised to give her a gift he calls for a slave girl by the name Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam and he this king gives Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam to Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam and tells her you can please continue no harm will befall you Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam takes Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam with her and she goes to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and informs him about what happened. Some scholars mention that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was already informed by Allah azza wa jal in regard to whatever happened within the confines, within the walls of that palace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave his friend in the dark. Instead, he informed him about exactly what took place inside the palace. So, so uh, that incident ends there and they continue. So like I said, some historians mentioned that, that this happened on the way to Palestine. Some say it was after they had settled down in Palestine. So they go now and settle down in Palestine. If we go with the first version, they go and settle down in Palestine. So a long period of time passes. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was now becoming old and frail. And he had not been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a child. He, was not, he, had, he had not been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a child. So his wife, Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, she herself one day suggested to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, Ya Ibrahim, why don't you marry Hajar? And you know, through that marriage, perhaps she may conceive a child for you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam thought about it and he agreed to marry Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam. He marries her and by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she gives birth to a baby boy. Allahu Akbar. She gives birth to a baby boy. And this baby boy was named as Ismail. This baby boy was named as Ismail, the first child of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, just imagine the happiness of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. His first born, a baby boy, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. The coolness to his eyes, Allahu Akbar. Now, after Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam gave birth, but there was a lot of attention on Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam, or rather given to Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam. There was a lot of attention given to Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. And Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam felt left out and suddenly she became very possessive of her husband. Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, she became very possessive of her husband and she tells her husband to take Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam and Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam to another land. She said, you take them and keep them with you in another land, don't keep them here. Ibrahim والسلام, was contemplating in this regard, was thinking about it. And then the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to Ibrahim والسلام, to take Hajar, his wife Hajar والسلام, and his son Ismail والسلام, to a land, a far away land, which is to be known as Mecca, insha'Allah ta'ala, as we will uh, discuss the story. So, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he abides by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He takes Hajar and Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, and he leaves the land that he was in. In other words, they were in Palestine. He leaves Palestine and now head, heads towards uh, Mecca. Now Mecca at that time was a barren land. It was a barren desert. There was not a human being in sight. No water, no trees, nothing. Just a dry, barren land. But the command of Allah was to go and leave your wife and your son there. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he takes them, he goes there and he leaves them there and he starts to head back. Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam, being a mother who had just given birth to a young baby, panic gripped her and she runs behind Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and she asks him, Ya Ibrahim, why are you leaving us and going? Why are you leaving us and going? Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he kept quiet and he kept moving. She kept on repeating the question, Ya Ibrahim, tell me why are you leaving us here and going? There's not a human being inside, not a tree inside, no water, we will die, we will starve. Why are you leaving us and going? Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam did not reply because you must understand the plight of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. He's leaving his wife and his firstborn, the coolness of his eyes, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, in the middle of a desert and he's going. Just try to imagine the grief and the turmoil of emotions that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam must have been going through. 
He was feeling so sad, but he had to abide by the command of Allah. Finally, Hajar asks Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, Ya Ibrahim, tell me, is this a command of Allah? Are you leaving us because Allah commanded you? To which Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam replied, yes. It is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No sooner he informed her that it was a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she, you know, her heart was at peace. Because she knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would look after her and would look after her son. So she, so she goes back to Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam and Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he leaves to Palestine. Now my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, just try to understand the level of tawakkul amidst these individuals. Just amazing, the levels of tawakkul. You look at the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, there are so many examples of tawakkul, of complete reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like I said yesterday, these stories are not to keep us entertained, but rather for us to derive lessons from. There are so many lessons to be derived from the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now look at Haja. In the middle of a desert, a barren, bare desert. But the minute she asks her husband, Allahu amaraka bihada, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command you in this regard? He replies, yes, her heart is at peace. Because why? She had complete reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is the best disposer of my affairs. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah has my best interests by him and he will look after me. She had this complete trust. She goes back to Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam and as Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was leaving them, he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a heavy heart. He prays to Allah azza wa jal. Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri dhi zara. بواد غير ذي زرع عند بيتك المحرم ربنا ليقيموا الصلاة فاجعل أفئدة من الناس تهوي إليهم وارزقهم من الثمرات لعلهم يشكرون He prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a heavy heart Oh Allah I have made my offspring, my family, to dwell biwadin ghayri dhizar. I have made them to dwell, I have left them in, an, in a barren valley. In a valley that has no cultivation whatsoever. A barren valley in the Baytik al-Muharram by your sacred house because that was the point, that was the spot where the Kaaba was to be built. Rabbana liyuqimu salah O Allah, let them perform a salah فَجَعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ and let the hearts of mankind فَجَعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ let the hearts of the people incline towards them let people be kind towards them تَهُوِي إِلَيْهِمْ وَارْزُقُهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ and O oh Allah provide them with fruits so that they may give thanks unto you so that they may render gratitude my dear Brothers and sisters in Islam, scholars rahimahumullah mentioned that this dua goes on until today and until the day of Qiyamah. And that is why you see the lands of Mecca and Medina being blessed so much, Allahu Akbar. Because after all, he said, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati. Look at the words, my offspring. It was just not Ismail, alayhi salatu wasalam. Generation after generation, and as you all are well aware, I'm sure, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, his lineage traces back to Ismail alayhi salatu wa sallam. Ismail alayhi salatu wa sallam was the great great grandfather of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Arabs who live in Mecca today are blessed so much. The lands are blessed so much because of the sacrifice and the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam. وَرْزُقُهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ Provide them with ample provisions. Today you can see it. You know, they are, being, they are blessed so much by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the dua of this great prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he leaves his wife Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam and he goes. Now, there was some food and water that they had with them. This little food and water ran out. The little food and water that they had with them, with Hajar, in the sense that she had with her, 
she and her child, the little food and water that they had ran out and now the little child, young Ismail, he starts to cry out of hunger. He starts to weep and cry out of hunger. Now, Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there for them. Like I said earlier, she had mastered the concept of tawakkul. But her motherly instincts started to kick in. You know, she was a mother at the end of the day and she was worried for her child and she starts to panic because she couldn't see a single human being inside, not a single bird. You know, if there were birds, at least that would indicate that there's some water. No water, no life whatsoever. So she starts to panic and she climbs up a hill known as Safa. She climbs up a hill known as a Safa. From that hill she looks whether there's anybody to be seen. She cries out, please help us, please help us. She climbs up the hill as Safa and then runs back and climbs up another hill known as Al Marwa. A Safa and Marwa. Safa, Marwa. She kept running back and forth crying for help. She runs seven times. Seven times ending on Marwa. Unlike today, don't think of the hills, you know, today when you go, mashallah, you've got the nice air conditioning going on, you've got the cool flows, you've got enough and more zamzam to quench your thirst to run. You have to put yourselves in the shoes of Hajj, alayhi salatu wasalam. Hot burning sand, barren desert. We run to commemorate and to remember our mother, Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam. But she was running out of panic. Her child is crying in the middle of a desert, no shade, no nothing whatsoever, and she's panicking and she's running back and forth. Okay? She runs seven times up and down the, these two crude hills at that time, as Safa and Al Marwa, and the seventh time she ends on Marwa, and then she hears someone by her child. She just feels the presence of someone by her child. And she looks towards Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, and she sees a shadow of an individual, you know, the silhouette of an individual. So she runs to the child, wondering who is by my child, and she finds Jibreel alayhi salam has come. Jibreel alayhi salam has arrived by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Certain scholars state that he struck the ground with the tip of his wing. Certain other scholars state that he struck the ground with his foot. No sooner he struck the ground, water starts to gush out. A spring broke out and water started to gush from the crack in the ground. And this water was such a blessed type of water. This is the water to be known as Zamzam. And this is the water that we consume when we go to Makkah, when we go to the lands of Makkah today. This water, this blessed water started to flow. Started to flow. Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam, she quenches her thirst and she quenches the thirst of her son Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. This was a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This water, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, ma'u zamzam lima shuribala. The water of zamzam is for what you drink it for. So, scholars rahimahumullah highlight that if you have any need, if you have any dua that you want to make, drink the water of zamzam and intend that, insha'Allah ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal will answer your dua. Especially those who are suffering due to sicknesses, psychological problems, marital issues, marital problems between two spouses, scholars state, let the two spouses drink zamzam water and let them intend that the problems be resolved amongst themselves. Because ma'u zamzam lima shuribala. The water of zamzam is for what it is drunk. If you drink the water of Zamzam with a specific intention, with firm conviction, with deep belief grounded in your heart, insha'Allah ta'ala, Allah Azza wa Jal will answer your dua. So the two spouses were having marital problems, let the two spouses drink Zamzam water and let them intend that these problems be solved, let our hearts be filled with love for one another. At times people go around searching for what? Love portions. Magical love potions. They go around asking all these voodoo doctors, can I have a love potion? I want my husband to fall in love with me. I want my wife to fall in love with me. We're having problems. And the voodoo doctor, he makes a nice, uh, you know, concoction out of, you know, what not. But look, we have a powerful liquid, zamzam. Drink it as much as possible. Drink it as much as possible and intend that which you wish. Inshallah ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your du'as. 
Now, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, trees started to grow because naturally when water sprouts from somewhere, it becomes like an oasis in the middle of a desert. And now trees started to grow, date palms started to grow, birds started to fly overhead. Now at that point, there was a caravan that was crossing and they too were hunting for water. And during those days, whenever you spot a circle of birds, then you can come to a conclusion that there has to be water or trees or something like that. So they saw some birds overhead, in the sense close to that area, and they make their way towards the water. The minute they reach Ma'u Zamzam, the spring, they see uh, an amazing sight, a lady with a young child. So they thought that, okay, this belongs to her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, put this in their hearts. Why? The dua of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Let the hearts of people be inclined towards my family. Let the hearts of people be inclined towards my family. So they go up to her, they go up to Umm Ismail, the mother of Ismail, Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam, and they ask her permission. Can we, you know, refresh ourselves? Can we quench our thirst? Can we water our animals, please? To which she grants them permission. They water their animals and they realize that this is a really nice, blessed place and they settled down there. They settled down there. They were an Arab tribe. They were an Arab tribe by the name Jurhum, if I'm not mistaken. They settled down there, and that's when civilization begins in Mecca. And this is the story of Mecca. This is how Mecca began, the lands of Mecca. So the area began to develop day by day, and that was the beginning of the blessed lands of Mecca. Now Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, he starts to grow, he starts to grow, now that becomes a little village there, people come there and now they have, you know, trade happens there, everything is happening like normal, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, starts to grow. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he used to visit them often, he used to visit them often, he used to be in Palestine and he used to come to Mecca to visit Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam, and his beloved son Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. Now Ismail, he grows, he grows and now he becomes a young Adolescent, he starts to help his father, he's running around, he's helping his father. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran when his son was old enough to walk with him. In the sense he used to walk with him, he used to help his father. Now this is the time when you know a father really treasures his son because every father at the end of the day wishes that his son must look after him. For example, if, he, if the father has a business, he wishes that the son should, should take up after him and take the business and run the business, look after him, look after his family. This is every father's wish. You see, I mean, we are created with this natural uh, element of jealousy, which is not good, we have to contain it. We have to contain it, but we are human beings and we are created with this natural element of jealousy. Where at times we look at others and we feel these feelings of jealousy. But have you ever seen a father ever jealous of his son? Every father on the face of this earth wishes what for his son? That his son should become better than him. Should become better than him. If he does not wish so, he is not a father. He is not a father. Every father wishes the best for his child, for his son. So likewise, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam wished the very best for his son. And this was the time he was treasuring his son. When the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down. It was an immense test. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it in the Noble Quran. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعْهُ السَّعِيَ قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he sees a dream. He sees a dream. And the dreams of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam are true. They are revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unlike our dreams, we see all kinds of things. But the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, their dreams are revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does he see? He sees that he is sacrificing, he's slaughtering his son, Allahu Akbar, his beloved son. So he goes to his son now and he tells him, Ya Bunay, my dear son, my beloved son, Inni arafil manami anni al bahuk. I saw a dream in which I was slaughtering you, I was sacrificing you. What do you think of this dream? Now look at the reply. Look at the mature reply of this boy, Allah Akbar. He did not say, Dad, are you crazy? You're trying to slaughter me. 
I mean, this is what we would say today, the youngsters of today. They would look at it and say, something wrong with you. Shall I report you to the authorities? You're abusing me. But look at the reply of Ismail What does he say? قَالَ يَا أَبَتِ فَعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ سَتَجِدُنِي إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ Oh my dear father, if al ma tu'mar, do that which you have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he was an intelligent boy. He knew that the dreams of his father were not just mere dreams. They were revelation from Allah. It was a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He calmly replies, Ya abati fa'al ma tu'mar. Do what you have been commanded. And he did not stop there. What else did he say? Satajiduni insha'a Allahu minas sabirin. He did not say, oh, you know, he did not start to grumble. He did not complain. And he said, what to do? We are prophets, so we have to go ahead with this. So go on, go and sacrifice me now. He said, go ahead, dear father. Satajiduni insha'Allah min as By Allah, you will find me from those who are patient. Allah. He reassures his father. He tells his father, go ahead, don't worry about me. You will find me a patient person. Go ahead. Allahu Akbar. Look at the beautiful reply. So what happens now? Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he has to comply. He has to abide by the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He takes his beloved son. You know, the story is easy to relate unto you. But you have to put yourself in the shoes of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Just imagine if you were commanded to slaughter your son, your firstborn, your eldest son. How would you feel? How would you feel? If you so, see, you know, as we go on with the story, you'll understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day, what was made to be sacrificed was a ram, was a sheep from Jannah. But just say, hypothetically, if it was part of the Sharia, ah, and if Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam had to really sacrifice his son, now we, what do we do when the season of Hajj comes? We slaughter animals. But if Allah had decreed that he slaughter his son, what would we have to do? Every Hajj we would have to slaughter our firstborn. And just imagine how much of, you know, grief we would be in. And how difficult that would be for us. Just put yourself in the shoes of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. But he did not bat an eyelid. Remember, it was not like he was blessed with a son at a very young age. At a very old and frail age, he was blessed with a young boy, a son. And now he's been commanded by Allah, slaughter him. Sacrifice him. And he did not hesitate. He did not say, Ya Allah, why Ya Allah, my little son, let me spend a little more time with him. He did not complain. He, you, do, you, do you see any ayats mentioning? Look at the reply of the son. Go ahead, dad. Go ahead, father. You will find me from those who are patient. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he takes his son sadly. And he goes now to fulfill the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He takes a knife, just like we take a knife when we are about to slaughter the animal during the season of Hajj. He sharpens the knife, just like we sharpen the knife. He sharpens the knife and then he goes by his son. And you know what Ismail says now? Father, lay me on the ground facing downwards. Lay me on the ground facing downwards. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he asks his son, Ya Ismail, why are you telling me to do this? Then Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam says, No father, if you lay me with my face facing upwards, you will have to look at my face when slaughtering me and that might result in your fatherly emotions gripping you and you will find it difficult. It will be very emotional. You will find it difficult to go ahead with the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So lay me facing downwards so that that fatherly mercy will not overtake you and so that you will be able to fulfill the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the beauty of this incident, Allah Akbar. Look at the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where on earth are we in comparison? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command us to slaughter our sons? We are commanded to do what? Pray five times a day. Give out your zakah. Fast the month of Ramadan. Simple commandments in comparison to these great commandments, Allah Akbar. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he lays his father down. And he lays Ismail down. And he takes the knife 
and places it on the neck of his son. And he tries to cut. He tries to cut, the knife does not cut. He tries to cut, again the knife does not cut. Just imagine, the knife is on the neck. The knife is on the neck. And he is moving it back and forth. The knife is not cutting. Ismail, alayhi salatu wasalam, he cannot see what's happening. He is looking downwards. He says, Father, go on. Cut it harder. Look, he, he's trying, he's trying, but the knife is not cutting. The knife is not cutting. And that's when Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, he hears a voice. وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَيَّا إِبْرَاهِيمُ Oh, Ibrahim. He looks. Who's calling me? قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ رُؤِيَا You have fulfilled the dream. You have fulfilled your vision. إِنَّا كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And verily, we reward the muhsinoon. We reward the ones who do good. So he had fulfilled the dream. In other words, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and Ismail, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ When they abided by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both of them passed this test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with flying colors. Allahu Akbar, flying colors. They passed the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah azza wa jal, He sends down a ram. A male sheep from the heavens. Scholars Rahimahullah mentioned that this sheep was grazing in the meadows of Jannah, in the gardens of paradise. And this sheep was sent down to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And he was commanded to sacrifice the sheep, the ram, in place of Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. To which he did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Inna hadha lahu al balahu al mubin. I'm not saying that it is a it was a great test. No scholar said that it was a great test. Allah Azza wa Jal He states, Inna hadha lahu al balahu al mubin. Verily, it was a manifest. It was a great trial. Inna hadha lahu al balahu al mubin. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala who put Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam through the test. He is affirming. Indeed, it was a great test upon Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He rewards Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam so much to the extent, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, until today and until the day of Qiyamah, the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, they commemorate Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. We commemorate this test of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam by doing what? Every season of Hajj, we sacrifice animals to commemorate the sacrifice of our father Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now a few days pass by. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was, was with his wife Sara, where in Palestine now. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam in general was an individual known for his hospitality and generosity. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he was known for his hospitality and generosity. So one day he receives some guests, some guests come home. And in general, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam used to be such a generous person that he used to feed people a lot. He, could, he had the habit that he could never eat alone. He could never eat alone. He had to invite someone over and he had to eat with someone. This was his habit. He was such a generous individual. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about these guests. Has the story been told to you? Has the story reached you of the, of the honored guests? There were noble guests who visited Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now who were these noble guests? They were Jibreel, Mikael, and Israfil alayhi salatu wasalam. Three special angels, the most special angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jibreel, Mikael, and Israfil alayhi salatu wasalam. They were the three guests who came to visit Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam in the guise of human beings. They did not come in the form of angels, they came in the guise of human beings. When they came to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, they said, Salam, salamun alayk, peace be upon you. Then he replies, Qala salamun qawmun munkaroon. He said, peace be unto you as well. You are strangers, I don't know you. Who are you all? He asks them, who are you all? And after welcoming them and after all the pleasantries had been exchanged, فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ فَجَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ سَمِينٍ 
he turned to his household, in other words, his family, and he brought out Ijlin Samin, a roasted calf. A roasted calf. Calf is the little one of a cow. A roasted cow, a roasted calf. He brings it and serves it to his guests. And as you all know, the angels, do they eat? They don't eat. Angels don't eat. They don't eat, they don't drink. Their provision, their sustenance is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he put forward the food, they did not even touch a tiny piece. Now Ibrahim والسلام, was feeling very strange. Just imagine if someone comes to your house and you are being very generous to them and you lay out a banquet and if that individual does not touch anything from your table, you will feel, why are you not eating? I mean, is there some problem between us, right? So Ibrahim والسلام, in those days especially, when travelers used to come from afar, they used to be ravenous, they used to be very hungry. And when you lay food, they would polish the dish. Because they used to come from afar, they would be very hungry. And he lays out a roasted calf, a tasty meal, and they're not touching the food. So he asks them, Qala ala ta'kulun, Why aren't you not eating? Will you not eat from the food that I have uh, put forward? To which they then went on to inform Ibrahim والسلام, because they saw the, you know, the fear in Ibrahim والسلام's eyes. They said, Ya Ibrahim, we're not just any ordinary guests. We are angels who have been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are angels who have been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they go on to say that, Oh Ibrahim, we bring glad tidings. We bring glad tidings unto you that you and your wife Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, are going to be blessed with a child, with a baby boy. Now Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, this was, you know, this took her, uh, you know, this gave her a huge shock because she was so old and so was Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So she says, you know, she kind of like, uh, you know, she couldn't believe it. So she says, we are going to get a child at this old age, to which uh, the angels reply, it is by the will of Allah and Allah can do whatever He wills. And then they go on to state that they had come for a completely different purpose, but they were also commanded to go and give glad tidings. Now what was the purpose that they had come down for? Ibrahim والسلام, asked them, المرسلون, What purpose then have you come for, O messengers? They reply, قَالُوا إِنَّا أُرْسِلْنَا إِلَىٰ قَوْمٍ مُجْرِمِينَ They said, we have been sent by Allah to a people who are mujrimun, who are criminals, who are sinners, who are transgressors. لِنُرْسِلَ عَلَيْهِمْ حِجَارَةً مِنْ تِينَ To send down, to rain upon them stones of baked clay. This was a punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They had come down to render the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to destroy that nation. Now which nation was this? This was the nation of the Prophet Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. This was the nation of the Prophet Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. This story we will discuss in a day or two inshallah ta'ala. Perhaps tomorrow if we, can, if we conclude the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Nevertheless, the angels had come down for that purpose. But along the way, they were instructed to give glad tidings unto Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now days pass, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam with a son, just as he was uh, informed. And this boy's name was Ishaq. And now Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam leaves Ishaq and Sarah alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu wasalam in Palestine. And he heads to visit Hajar and Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam in Mecca. He who had now divided his time where he used to spend time in Palestine as well as in Mecca. He used to spend equal time with both his wives, both his families. So now when he goes to visit Ismail والسلام, in Mecca, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him and informs him of something. Now this is the next command. The command was, O Ibrahim, build a house of Allah for his worship. Build a house of Allah for his worship. And this house was to be known as the Kaaba. This house was to be known as the Kaaba. This was the first house of Allah. The first Bayt min Buyutillah to be built. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Noble Quran. Verily, the first house of worship appointed for mankind was that at Bakka. 
Now, Bakka was the previous name for Mecca. Bakka later on became Mecca. The first house to be placed for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was at Bakka. Mubarakan wa hudan lil alameen. It was full of blessing and guidance for alameen, the mankind and the jinn kind. So, now what happens? Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam informs his son Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam about the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They both get together and they start constructing this house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal mentions, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُوا إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ And remember when Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and his son Ismail were raising the foundations of the house, the Kaaba at Mecca, they kept saying, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ O oh, our Lord, accept this from us, accept this from us. Verily, you are the all-hearer, the all-knower. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, look. They have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to build a house of Allah. And they are building the house and throughout the construction they keep praying to Allah, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا Another beautiful lesson to be derived from this particular juncture is that whatever you do, you can be involved in a huge project, a small project, you can be you know, involved in da'wah organizations, charity organizations, you can be involved with the masajid of Allah, you can be involved in any good deed. But remember, you must strive for ikhlas, that you do it solely for the pleasure of Allah, and you must also always pray to Allah, Ya Allah, accept this from us, accept this from us. We can be involved in so many projects. Look, the Anbiya, the two great prophets, they themselves are praying to Allah, Ya Allah, accept this from us, accept this from us. And what about you and I? You know, our projects fade away in comparison to this great project. They were building the first masjid, the first house of Allah. And they kept praying, Rabbana taqabbal minna, Rabbana taqabbal minna. So likewise, you and I, whatever we do, good deeds, we do it solely for the pleasure of Allah. And we keep praying to Allah, Ya Allah, accept it from us, accept it from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all the good deeds that we render unto Him. Amen. So they go on building until the last stone had to be placed. The last stone. Now, you have to understand that the Kaaba, was not as grand as how it is today. You didn't have the clock tower and you didn't have all of that. It was a crude building at that time, made of blocks of stone. It was a very simple house of Allah at that time. So they just placed stones and they built the house. But there was one last stone that had to be placed. Ibrahim والسلام, instructs his son Ismail to get that final stone. Ismail والسلام, now goes around searching for that final stone because the final stone had to be in a specific shape to fit that place. So he kept looking around for the stone and he drifted a little further away from his father and the construction. That's when Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam comes down and he asks Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, what are you looking for? Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam says, I'm looking for the final stone to complete the construction of the house of Allah. Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam then gives him a stone. A stone and he tells him this stone is from Jannah, is from paradise, go and complete the construction with it. Scholars rahimahumullah mention that there are two opinions. One is that Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam would have brought the stone at that point, at that point, or like I mentioned in the story of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, there is one opinion of the scholars that Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, when he came down from Jannah, he was sent with a stone. And this stone was lost and at that point it was recovered. At that point, it was recovered and it was pure white in color. It was milky white, pure white in color. And it was placed in the building and that is the stone known as Hajarul Aswad today. What is Hajarul Aswad? The black stone. So how come it was pure white? Scholars Rahimahumullah mentioned it was pure white and it turned black due to the sins of people. Due to the sins of people, it turned black. It was pure white in color at that time. So. The construction of the house of Allah was now complete. Allah Azza wa Jal commands Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam to proclaim and call out, to call out, to announce. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he asks Allah, Ya Allah, what am I to proclaim? What am I to call out? Allah Azza wa Jal then informs him, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِهِنَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقًا O oh, Ibrahim, proclaim to Finnas, proclaim to the entire mankind, 
about Hajj, about the pilgrimage of Allah. Yatuka Rijala, they will come to you on foot. They will come to you, they will come walking. Wa ala kulli dhamir, and they will come on every lean camel and horse. Yatina min kulli fajjin amik, and they will come from every deep and distant valley, distant mountain. They'll come from all over the place for Hajj. Now Ibrahim والسلام, was amazed. He asked Allah, Ya Allah, how am I to get the message across to the entire mankind whilst I am here in Mecca today? You know, if you put up a Facebook status, at least you have the confidence that it can reach people all around the world, depending on the amount of followers that you have. Or perhaps if you put it up on a platform where it will reach out to many people around the world. At that time, Ibrahim was wondering, Ya Allah, how will the message go to the entire mankind? Now who gave man the intellect to come up with all these online platforms, the World Wide Web? Who gave man the intellect? Did man come up with all of this by himself? It was Allah who gave man the intellect to come up with all these satellites, the internet, the world wide web, all these social media platforms. It was Allah who gave man the brain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, Ya Ibrahim, your duty is to do it and we will look after the conveying path. We will make the message reach every human being. So. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he climbs a little hill, a little mountain, and he proclaims, Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, come to the house of Allah on hajj, in pilgrimage. Come, to, come and visit the house of Allah in pilgrimage. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, with this I will conclude inshaAllah ta'ala, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, he states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took on the responsibility of conveying the message so much to the extent that at the point Ibrahim والسلام, announced it, at that point, every single human being, every single creation, the heavens and the earth, heard the proclamation of Ibrahim والسلام, heard the announcement of Ibrahim والسلام. and not only that, every single child in the womb of its mother heard this announcement of Ibrahim والسلام. every drop of fluid that man is created from heard the announcement of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and it does not end there it goes on until the day of Qiyamah and this dua was answered as well and this is why people from all over the world today whenever you tune into the Makkah live channel what do you see? I'm sure most of you you have access to it in your country what do you see? people making tawaf of the Kaaba. Are they all from one locality? Are they all Arabs? No. You have Malaysians, Indonesians, Maldivians, Sri Lankans, Indians, Americans. You have people from all over the world. يَأْتُونَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجِّنْ عَمِيقٍ They will come from far and near. They will come from everywhere. يَأْتُونَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ They will come on foot. They will come using different modes of conveyance. And they will come from all over. Your job is to proclaim and we will see that the message is conveyed. Allahu Akbar. And Ibn Abbas goes on to state that until the day of Qiyamah, this will be the case. Look at Makkah. They keep expanding and they, they keep on expanding for what purpose? To cater more and more because the crowds are so huge in number. So many people visiting every single year, 365 days around the year. Allahu Akbar. The city that never sleeps. That is the city that never sleeps, Mecca. So many people coming from all over the world because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the dua, accepted the sacrifice of this great Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Allah azza wa jal's decree was that the call of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam would reverberate throughout the annals of time and the people would come from far and near to respond to the call. They all head to Mecca saying what? لبيك اللهم ما لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك They cry out, Oh Allah, we are present, we hear your call, لبيك, we respond and they head towards Mecca, Allahu Akbar. This was the call, this was the announcement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam 
to make and he did so obeying Allah Azza wa Jal. With that we conclude today's session. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, tomorrow we have a few more incidents to talk about Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Wasalam and then quickly we'll move on to a little about Ishaq Alayhi Salatu Wasalam and then we'll go on with the series Insha'Allah Ta'ala. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.